So we've kept it simple for today. The title of today's message is Feast on This Book. And I've brought an old school physical paper word of God, you know, that you can, you can do great preacher moves with. You can whack it. You can wave it around. You can flick the pages. It's a lot of fun, but I am actually using my printed notes so that I can find things quickly. This message series, it is going to run us over the next couple of months and it's a play on words because our, the, our, um, se- our theme for the year, okay, calm down, Rachel, our theme for the year is our feast and it's all about feasting on God's goodness and this particular message series is about feasting on the goodness of God's word and so while we're going to dial in with some laser focus on the Bible and what God says in the Bible and how he's given us the Bible as a tool to strengthen us even here and now all of these many years after these timeless words were written down onto paper While we're going to have laser focus on that for the next couple of months, it's really a foundation stone for the rest of our lives. And God is actually calling us back to his word as the primary nourishment of our lives. The primary nourishment of our lives, even more valuable than food in our bodies. And I've just got three reasons to get us started why I believe God is calling us back to seeing his word as the primary nourishment of our lives this year. They're going to come up on the screen. So first reason, it's eternal. The word of God is eternal. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. It is eternal. Even the beauty in creation, which we see all around us. It fades and it comes and goes in seasons, but the word of our God stands forever. The second reason why we're going to dial in and see God's word as the primary nourishment of our lives is that it can be trusted. Psalm 33 verse 4 says, For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything He does. Wow, that is a powerful word. The word of the Lord stands true and we can trust everything he does. You know, I've been in a season where I've been tested on that and I've had to come back to God and keep physically out of my mouth declaring that he can be trusted. His word is is true and he can be trusted. And the third reason I want to give us that will set a great foundation for where we're going today, the third reason why we're being called to see God's word as the primary nourishment of our lives is because it is alive and powerful. Hebrews 4 at verse 12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. There's something supernatural about the word of God. It's not the book, it's not the paper, it's not the pages, it's not the ink. It is the Word of God. It's living and breathing so that you and I who open our Bibles today here in Cessnock, New South Wales, Australia, of all the places in God's good creation, God will speak to us communally as the community of God and even individually into our unique set of circumstances. You know, people who are practiced in, the, in reading the Word of God know that you can go back to the same passage 25 different times in your life and God will speak to you in fresh ways. He'll breathe fresh life into your bones when you read an age-old scripture that maybe you even know from heart. Why? Because by the power of God's Spirit, It is alive and powerful. 
and it cuts through things. And what that means, I just feel to say right now, is that it brings clarity and it shows the difference between truth and lies. It shows the difference between truth and lies. So there's just three reasons I thought of to um, feast on this book. All right, how? do we feast on the Word of God? How do we learn to feast on the, God, the Word of God as though it is more nourishing even than the physical food we put in our bodies? Well, the first way is this. We've got to learn how to feast on God's Word daily. Just like physical food, we've got to learn the discipline of feasting on God's Word daily. You know, Job is an interesting character in the Bible. And uh, if you read the story of Job, it's a difficult story to read. It's also a difficult story to understand. It's very allegorical. It almost starts as though it says, once upon a time, there was a man named Job. Personally, I don't believe Job is an actual man who actually lived. I believe the story about Job's life and the suffering that he endured and the conversations that he had with his friends in the story are there to help us try to gain a glimpse of what God is really like. And here's what Job says. He says, I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. This is where Job is trying to remind himself that even though He's been a faithful guy. He's been obedient to God's word. He's revered God's word. And even though he's been through all of these trials and all of this suffering, it's, it's kind of the, the focus of the book of Job, if you're not familiar. Even though he's gone through all of those things, he still knows that the treasure he has in God's word is more valuable than daily food. But don't just take Job's word for it because I just told you he's a made-up character. Let's go to what Jesus says about the word of God. In Matthew 4, 4, it says, But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, there's a revelation. You and I don't live just by the bread that we put in our bodies, like we had some of Luke's sourdough last week and I've had some of Luke's sourdough all weekend and it has been very nourishing to me. However, Jesus says we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what's interesting about that quote of Jesus's is that he's actually quoting an Old Testament scripture, which is where God is reminding the people who wandered around in the wilderness before Jesus ever came to earth that he had been their provider. And even though they were abandoned slaves, slaves that had escaped, escaped slavery and then wandering around in this desert place with nothing beautiful to see on their horizon, God had provided them with daily food. But then he'd given them more than that. He'd given them his word as a way to live. And so Jesus is reminding the people in the New Testament that people don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I know that it is hard to build a daily Bible reading habit. And to be frank with you, it's taken me almost 40 years, and I'm the same age as Luke, so I'm just being very, very vulnerable about that. I'm turning 44 very soon. It's taken me nearly 40 years, and I've had every best advantage in the world because I've been very blessed to grow up in a Christian home where my parents valued our family being a part of the wider community of faith. So we were faithfully in church every week. And so for every week of my life, I've been in an environment. I've been blessed to be in an environment where I'm encouraged to make daily Bible reading a part of my life. But I'll be frank with you, it's actually really hard. Can anybody identify with the fact that it's actually really hard to build a daily Bible reading habit? And in fact, I've got four children and I particularly found it hard in what I call my decade of sleeplessness. So because I have four children and, you know, you go through a cycle there of like pregnancy, giving birth, breastfeeding, like you just have this 
for me, it was a decade because I had all that. Like, it was my dumb decision, right? And for me, it was a decade because I had all of those children of having disturbed sleep and not getting great nights of sleep. And for some reason, this is not from God, but I used to beat myself up about failing to build a daily Bible reading habit. Because when you got up 15 times in the night, sometimes it, first thing in the morning, all you're hearing is another cry, another, another call for mum, there's some kind of emergency or situation that has to be resolved. And it's not the first thing necessarily that comes into your mind. So just over five years ago, I've got a photo just to prove that I'm not lying to you. This is, this is in the Bible app. This is my streak. Okay, so it's 1,963. That's today. Yeah, I'm not asking for applause. Um, because just over five years ago, I'm nearly coming up to 2,000. That's awesome. But what I've learned is that the Bible app no longer gives me any like little celebrations for hitting 50 days or 100 days. It's just like they've forgotten about me. I get no... No fireworks when I clock over a, a big number. I'm very disappointed about that. But just over five years ago, I was at a conference and it was October. And I just, I think I lost my streak that week because I was out of routine. I was staying somewhere that wasn't at home. I was tired because at conferences, you stay up late and talk to people after the night sessions. You get to bed very late, then you get up early. And we were in Port Macquarie, so I obviously had to go for a run along the waterfront because obviously I don't get to run along the waterfront here when I go for my morning run. And so I forgot to read my Bible one day that morning. And I was devastated. I can't remember what number my streak was on that day. But the next day, who's ever done this? The day after, you miss the streak. Yes, there's only a couple of honest people in the room. The day after, you forget to read your Bible and you open that app and your streak is back to one. Oh, it's like a knife to the heart. So that day, at the end of that conference, I said, this is it. This is the new me. I'm getting one whole year, 365 days. That's my goal. I am opening that app every single day for 365 days. Now, a lot of that is just my sheer stubbornness and willpower. So I'm also prepared to be frank with you and let you know that I have not had like a mind-blowing revelation of God's goodness for every single one of those 1,963 days in a row that I have opened my Bible app as the first thing I do in the morning. That's how I do it, by the way. It's the first app I open. It's the first app I open. Don't open any other apps until I've opened that app and read my Bible. But sometimes I'm literally only reading the verse of the day, and then coming back and studying later. So even though I don't, I don't have a lightning bolt style revelation about God every single one of those days. However, it's more like making the discipline of giving God permission to speak into my life every day is what makes room for those holy, mind-blowing moments of revelation. Craig Groeschel is a pastor, leader, author, speaker who I respect. And uh, he's got a little saying for how to develop the discipline of praying daily with your spouse. And he says this, keep it short, keep it consistent, and if you miss a day, don't miss two. And I think it's actually a catchy way to think about building a daily discipline of reading God's word. Keep it short. So I will always advise people when you're just starting to learn to read the Bible every day, don't try and read the whole Bible in a year because you're going to set yourself up to fail. Just start with the verse of the day. Keep it short, keep it consistent, and then don't bring shame on yourself. Don't don't feel like you're a failure if you miss a day. Just if you miss a day, don't miss two. If you miss a day, don't miss two. If you miss a day, don't miss two. And as you continue 
to live in the freedom and the life that God's given you, then you will discover that you'll miss less and less days. So whether it is that you're trying to build a habit of praying daily with your spouse or reading the word of God as your daily food, keep it short, keep it consistent. And if you miss a day, don't miss two. The second way that we as a church community over these next couple of months and beyond are going to learn how to feast on God's word is well, or I like to say with excellence, because we've just come off the back of a preaching series about our cultural values as a church, and excellence is one of our cultural values. So what do I mean by that, about learning to feast on God's word well? Well, mature Christianity means actually devoting an entire lifetime, not just two months of a preaching series or one year of a church service theme, to growing in our understanding of God's word and not just reading it to tick a box or build our streak in the Bible app. Spiritual maturity and mature Christianity means devoting a lifetime to growing in our understanding of God's word. Here's why. If you don't learn to read the Bible well, you will read things like eat this scroll, which we read at the top of the message, and think, maybe, I mean, maybe you won't think this, but maybe you think, do I have to go home and pull the pages out of this thing and put them in my mouth and chew them up and swallow them? Because that's what God told Ezekiel. If we don't learn to read the Bible well, then maybe we'll think that. Here's another one. In the New Testament of the Bible, you'll find this quote. Women should be silent and submissive during the church meetings. Women should be silent and submissive during the church meetings. You could be a first-time guest to our church. You might have never been to church before in your life. You might play this game where you roll the dice on the Bible and say, speak to me, Lord, and read, women should be silent and submissive in the church gathering. And you might come here and you might look at this woman, I am a woman, who is not at all silent and think, "How this church is not following the word of God. Because if you don't learn to read the word of God well, then you will take a verse like that. It's called cherry picking a verse out of context and you will build a theology around it which will be incorrect. Now, my favourite example of this, which I'm going to share, is this. In the Old Testament of the Bible, you can find this verse. If two Israelite men get into a fight and the wife of one... <laughs> I can't even say it without laughing. And the wife of one tries to rescue her husband by grabbing the testicles of the other man, you must cut off her hand. Show her no pity. And all of a sudden, it's my first time at church. They're reading this from the pulpit. God knows why. And all of a sudden, I think, wow. I didn't realise this was such a problem in our society here in Cessnock, New South Wales, Australia. I have obviously not had my eyes peeled for the women who are trying to break up fights between their husband and other men by grabbing them at the crotch. <laughs> and perhaps I better carry a knife because God's word says that woman should be shown no pity and no mercy. If I, if I read, that is actually in this book. I could read any of those passages and completely misunderstand the heart of why they're there. I've actually heard a really good teaching on that verse, which talks about how that particular verse actually represents good news for women and a greater level of equality for women and actually mirrors the overarching narrative of the entire Bible and Jesus who came to empower women and prove that they had equal value to men in a society where that was not 
the case and where he turned society and culture, in fact, upside down with this groundbreaking idea that women held as much, uh, much value and even spiritual authority as men. But in order to know that, we have to learn to understand the difference between mere words on the page written to a specific people group about a specific set of circumstances at a specific time in history and understand what God is saying to us in the here and now, which still rings true and which rings true across the whole book, not just one verse at a time. John 1 says this, In the beginning, the Word, capital W, that's a way to describe King Jesus. In the beginning, the Word, Jesus, already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Right from the beginning, Jesus was there. He was with God and he was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God, in fact, created everything through him, through Jesus. And nothing was created except through him. The word, Jesus, gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. And so if Jesus was there right from the beginning, if all of creation was brought into being through Jesus, then those Old Testament passages, we have to learn how to read through the lens of a God who came to earth to dwell among us, show us a new way to live, died on a cross to take away the burden of sin and the burden of the law that existed before he was physically present on the earth and then rose again to life so that we could live forever with him in freedom. We have to learn how to read the whole thing in the context of the whole thing. And the last thing that we've got to kind of get a grip of as we start to feast on this book is the principle of eating and acting. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I feel like I've heard that this has changed now, but I'm not sure of my facts. I haven't looked it up. But when I was a kid, on a hot summer's day, if you wanted to go for a swim after eating at the pool or the beach or whatever, there was like this urban legend, I don't know how much truth there was to it, that you had to wait half an hour after eating before you swam or else you would die. I mean, basically, <laughs> that was the weight with which this message was communicated to me as a child. After you've eaten, if you want to swim again, you've got to wait half an hour. We're all clocking it down on the clock or else like it's like your parents were washing their hands of you. Well, if you get in that water, I can't be held responsible for what will happen to you. However, <laughs> eating the Word of God as though it is spiritual food is different to that. Because just as eating without moving makes you fat, that's true, isn't it? If you eat and don't move, you, you, like real food, you'll get fat. So reading the Word of God and not acting on what it says makes you spiritually fat and, in fact, uninspiring. You've got nothing to bring if you just eat the word and don't act on it. James 1 puts it like this. He says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's words. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, 
walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. You know, feasting on God's Word will make you uncomfortable sometimes. And feasting on God's Word will convict you of areas in your life which still need transformation and growth. That's still happening to me all these 40-something years later. It's alive and powerful. It's still convicting me of areas in my life where I need to grow and change. But also, feasting on God's Word will bring encouragement, inspiration, fresh vision and strategy and a sense of purpose into your everyday. It's alive and powerful. And so it brings life. It brings things to light. It brings freedom. Now, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment because... I want you to consider that verse that we read that describes the Word as Jesus, or Jesus as as the Word. And I just want to make an opportunity here in our gathering, and online if you're joining us there, to accept that Word as true, to accept that Word, King Jesus, as the life that you need in your life, as the light that you need guiding your path. I know hearts are open in our room today. And there's no better time to say yes to Jesus being the king of your life than right here in this moment. It's what brings the word to life is saying yes to Jesus. So if that's something that you would like to respond to today, it's an invitation. Why don't you be bold and just show me who you are by raising your hand. Say, yep, that's me today. God's Word has been alive and powerful in my life today. And I'm ready to respond. I'm ready to accept the invitation to have Jesus be the light for my path. I'm just going to leave it a moment longer. Just give me a quick wave if you're ready to respond today. And then together as a whole community, we're going to pray a prayer that invites Jesus to do just that. I saw that hand either for the first time or maybe the hundredth time. Let's just pray and invite Jesus. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.